Good morning, everyone. My name is Megan McKelvey, and I am with the League of California Cities. I will also be your host today. Welcome to the League's webinar series um, regarding COVID. Today, we're going to talk about keeping resort towns afloat, managing revenue shortages, and tourism messaging during COVID. Next. Our speakers today are Jim Lewis, City Manager of Pismo Beach, and Chris Freeland, City Manager of Indian Wells. Next. This series is really for our membership so you can learn and talk to other cities about how COVID has been affecting them. So please ask questions during, this, um, during our webinar presentation. First, to let you know, this webinar is being recorded and you will be able to see a link both on the league's website and you'll be uh, receiving it after today's event. You might have noticed that all of your lines are on mute. Um, however, our panelists have decided to do a discussion answer form. So after the brief presentations, we will be entertaining uh, both written questions and verbal questions. In order to do a verbal question, as you can see on your screen, there is a blue hand. Please click the blue hand and we will call on you in order. However, if you would like to do only a written question, please click the chat box and send your question to me, Megan McKelvey, and I will be verbally asking it for you. Um, I am, if you have any questions, please feel free to chat with league staff in that, um, that box, that chat box, and we will help you as much as we can. So without further ado, I do want to thank, greatly thank my two city managers for presenting. They are two of my favorites. So I'm very honored that they've taken the time to participate in this, in this webinar. So I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Chris Freeland. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I want to also thank the League of California Cities for hosting this webinar and to my fe fellow panelist, Jim Lewis. So as we get started, if we can move on to the next slide. Um, I'm here to share with you the revenue losses, strategies, and reflections that we are dealing with here in Indy Wells, which I'm sure will be similar in many other cities throughout California. Some of those include the financial impacts, uh, what are we doing here to you know, reduce our costs, uh, try and limit our use of our reserves, uh, forecasts for the summer and the coming months afterwards, what are messages to our tourists during this crisis, and the managing tourists who are traveling regardless of the stay at home work, because we do have some hotels that are open in, in our region. So move on to the next slide. I wanna to talk to you before we get started with the presentation, um, a little bit of information about Indian Wells. Um, I know many of you have been out here to visit for either vacation or for a conference, so you're quite familiar perhaps with our community, but I wanna share with you a few bullet points before we get started to set the tone of the presentation. Indian Wells is a contract city with a staff of only 30 personnel. Right now at City Hall, we've got five people working from City Hall and the remainder of the staff is actually at home. The average resident age is over 65. So when you think about that, this is a very you know, target population for the COVID virus. Uh, about 15 miles east of Palm Springs, we are home to the BNP uh, Paribas tennis tournament, except in 2020, unfortunately. Uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit. We are a major tourism community. Our general fund is $18 million with a total fund, our total funds of 53 million. And the Indian Wells Golf Resort, uh, which many of you play golf at or have been a part of different tournaments, is a city municipal facility and has its own individual budget of $16 million. So all in all, tourism makes up 67% of our city's general fund revenues. So the next slide, we'll talk about a little bit about the financial impacts from COVID-19. And what's, you know, I would say ironic, I'm not going to say funny, is timing is everything. All right. What I mean by that is uh, tourism in the desert is very seasonal, with much of our activity happening from October to May. COVID hit us right in the middle of our season out here. If it was a hit towards the end of the season, or even better, during the summer, the impact we would have felt here in Indian Wells would not be nearly as great as they are, have been today. Uh, we've had the closure of five city, ho city hotels, the cancellation of the tennis tournament, 
um, closure of our golf resort, uh, and then the overall loss of tourism due to shelter in place. So all in all, we've lost about $11 million, which we'll get to in just a second, but I wanna share with you about the cancellation of the tennis tournament. The tournament was to begin on March 9th. Okay, so we're going back to timing is everything. The tournament was canceled at 5 p.m. on March 8th. So just a few hours before it was scheduled to start. And it runs for two weeks and generates around three and a half to four million dollars in revenue during those two weeks for our city. That represents 20% of our general fund. And it was the very first major sports event that was canceled due to the virus. Um, and as many of you recall, the stay at home order didn't even become effective until March 19th. And so again, about time is everything, you know, for our community, a $4 million loss is pretty significant. And if it was just a couple weeks later that the tournament would have been canceled or not canceled, we'd be in a much different financial situation. Um, we're also, you know, highly dependent on a couple of festivals out here, Coachella and Stagecoach. Each of those generates about $350,000 per weekend for our local economy um, of Indian Wells, much less it does for the entire region. So uh, we're hopeful that they're going to have the, or the Coachella and Stagecoach in October. Uh, we're working closely with Mark Scott, the city manager of Indio, and others, and, and remain optimistic that's going to happen. And there's also even talk of having an additional um, festivals in April for Coachella, which would be great financially for all the cities. Uh, golf courses were all clo or closed here throughout the valley for a period of time. Those have since reopened, but those are huge money makers for the, uh, for the region. So in all, the city saw a 47% decrease in TOT so far and a 27% decrease in sales tax. So we'll go on to the next slide. We've talked about how the city has uh, you know, a general fund budget of 18 million and over 18 month period, we're estimating $11 million loss to our community. Uh, if you see up there, it comes from TOT losses of being significant. The admission tax is the revenue generated at the tennis garden. And then like many of you, sales tax, interest income, um, service charge losses, uh, some other funds that we're losing and then license and permits. And the other unfortunate situation for us in Indy Wells is our municipal golf course, you know, by the closure of the golf course and banquet operations, we're seeing a $1.3 million loss during that same period of time. So we'll go on to the next slide. You know, I am, have been city manager, it'll be a year tomorrow actually here in Indian Wells. And uh, I'm very fortunate that this community was very well prepared. We had excellent leadership before I got here. And the city has had, you know, a policy since 2012 of saving nearly $2 million a year in revenues and putting into our rainy day fund. So our reserves are about $40 million here in Indian Wells. Uh, and fortunately, and I'll share this with you in a little bit as we go through what we've done, we're hoping in the next 18 months not to touch our reserves. So since 2016, we've also, you know, um, made efforts to increase our financial uh, ability we implemented a medical billing program. Uh, we recently increased our TOT tax by 1% and we conducted a citywide fee study to make sure we were uh, recouping all of our funds. So if we go on to the next slide here. Before we move on, I think it's very important about communication. And this is something I hope that you can all tailor to your individual communities, all right? Because communication is essential. Right now, people are scared. Okay, whether it be they're stressed out about work, family, health issues, finances, whatever it may be. So here in Indian Wells, uh, what we're trying to do is make sure we're having constant communication with our stakeholders. We're having weekly or more frequent meetings, um, updating our city council on the finances of our city. Uh, we're also sending out tons of emails. Thank you to LEA California Cities for making sure to keep us educated on what's going on. Uh, weekly phone calls with the league. Uh, you know, I thank Aaron Sassy, our regional rep, who is, you know, making sure that our area city managers are getting together, as well as talking to our local assembly member later today. Um, our staff, I think it's essential to be talking to them right now, because of course, with financial challenges in cities, they're concerned about their financial stability. So the first thing I said when we start closing down operations is, your job is safe. To have that security and knowledge 
I think was very beneficial to them. You wanna make sure you're thanking them and congratulating them for their hard work, uh, but also remind them, you know, the city has done a great job preparing for this financial crisis, but we need to continue to look at other opportunities for new revenues and expenditure you know, reductions. Uh, we're sending out constant emails to the community telling them what's going on both from the county and state orders. We're telling them what, how our finances are being impacted, but then also we're working closely with our stakeholders, the Chamber of Commerce, the general managers of all of our resorts. Uh, we are working with you know, some of the retail center owners here in town, the Chambers of Commerce, and especially our Convention and Visitors Bureau, who's gonna help us get through this uh, virus situation. So next slide. So our cost savings plan was this. Um, when we talk about individual saving, our cities and their savings, please remember to be as conservative as you can with your numbers. And the reason I stress that is as we move forward, there's a, still a lot of unknowns that we're just gotta be prepared for. Uh, especially if there is a relapse as some people are speaking about. So here we've done in Indian Wells uh, deferrals and cost savings through June 30th of 2021, or I would say the next you know, several months. And we've done what we call a, you know, a financial head against the unknown and be prepared for that and have certain assumptions. Because as you remember, being a tourist community out here in the desert, during the summer, there's not a whole lot of revenues coming into our city. Uh, next slide, please. So here locally, here's what we've done to save some monies and defer things. Uh, we actually have expenditure reductions that we've put in place. Uh, we had a savings around $600,000 from the golf resort. Uh, one of the quality of life uh, pleasures out here is we help subsidize golf for our local residents at our municipal golf course at the golf resort. And so when the golf courses were closed, we had a little bit of savings there that was generated. We had surpluses that were estimated for fiscal year 2020 and 2021. As you can imagine, those surpluses are gone now. Uh, we're hoping for a surplus at the golf resort next year. And a lot of that comes from the fact that golf operations are very profitable, but we're assuming very little revenue from banquets or conferences because we feel that there's gonna be a, a delay before people feel comfortable traveling um, by plane to the region and whatnot. Uh, we do have some one-time money, which is uh, we're selling a piece of property here in the community that we were planning to do so anyway, as well as uh, we have some funds here of uh, selling some other assets that we were trying to liquidate uh, before the COVID happened. Some deferrals. The city has agreed to provide a $2 million contribution as well as other cities in our region to Eisenhower Hospital and Medical Center. Uh, we're gonna be delaying that. We've recap, reprioritized our capital projects and we do delay some other CIP projects that we were planning to do, as well as a planned contribution for capital improvements at the Living Desert here in Palm Desert in Indian Wells. So right now we're projecting savings greater than our um, losses, and that is again, because we wanna have that cushion for the unpredictable. So what I'd like to go is talk a little bit about tourism now in our region. So if you can go to the next slide, and we'll skip that and move on to the next slide after that, which is the regional impact. Here are the deferrals are up on the slide that we were talking about as well. So now here we're at the tourism, and now with the regional impact. Um, Tourism is the number one industry in our entire region. It's responsible for one out of five jobs and over 50, 53,000 employees here in our region. The Hospitality Workforce Relief Fund, this was something that the resorts and other folks put together to help provide some relief for um, the employees at all of our different resorts because again, 20% of the workforce out here is based on tourism. And as you can imagine, many of those are folks that are currently unemployed. Most of the hotels and resorts are closed. Uh, I know at our golf resort, since banquet facilities and the view restaurant there are closed, we actually let go over 200 employees at the golf resort alone. So as you've probably heard, the golf, uh, the California economic loss is over 72 billion, over 600,000 tourism jobs uh, from this industry. Uh, we believe the regional impact will be felt for some time. And while we are focusing on tourism, um, having worked in a city that depends on sales tax from auto sales, regional malls, hotels, and much more, I can only imagine um, how much 
each of those other city managers out there who depend on sales tax are being hurt as well. So I think the biggest you know, um, item about regional impact is our recovery also needs to be locally driven and with local solutions. Uh, I think it's unfair to think that you know, what's happening in Sacramento can be controlled here at the local level because our businesses, our region all have unique aspects. So we'll go on the next slide. I'll, uh, I'm not gonna go into too much detail here, but I love this campaign that the Greater Palm Springs uh, Convention Visitors Bureau has put out right now. And that is this whole region is saying, pause now, play later. And that is we wanna focus on keeping our community healthy, providing for the employees who've been affected and start planning uh, for that recovery. So if we go to the next slide, they have another campaign that we're in the, just kicking off and that is called Inspire, okay? And so we wanna to try to inspire families and travelers to come to the desert for their vacation and enjoy our beautiful resorts, spas, golf resorts, and you can golf in the morning out here in the summer because you can get out there before the heat hits uh, and much more. Our right now is to weather the storm, um, have a strategic reopening of tours in the Coachella Valley and uh, I want to share a little bit of the stats with you as we recover, it must be data driven to make sure that we put our scarce resources in the right place. Uh, right now our data is showing people are tired of being locked up. I'm, I'm, I'm one of those. Um, I want to travel this summer if possible. And there's a majority of people who wish to do so. But one of the things is they're concerned about flying. Until, and they, our data shows that people don't want to fly um, through, until at least 2021 is when they feel they'll be comfortable. And our data is also showing that folks want to do something relatively close to home. And so we are focusing on this idea of what's called staycations, targeting those that can easily drive out here to the desert. So our focus is going to be on the Los Angeles, San Bernardino, Orange County regions um, to come out here. And, you know, a lot of folks like to go out to the Las Vegas area. We're trying to shoot them to come this way. Um, next slide uh, is, you know, the whole idea of activating. We want Lastly, we want to get people back in our hotels safely for them, our tourism workers, and the entire community. So if you're wondering about visiting the desert, uh, there is something I think is very important for all you to remember. And that is, you know, President Trump and his administration recently said that sunlight and heat killed the virus. So where else but um, Indian Wells would you like to be when it's going to be probably 120 degrees here in about another 30 days or so. So this is the perfect place to plan your summer vacation. Uh, and with that, I just wanted to say thank you and conclude on my last slide and I'll turn it over to my dear friend, Jim. Hey, Chris, thanks a bunch. Really uh, appreciate you being part of the webinar today and uh, appreciate the leadership you're doing down there in Indian Wells. And I really wish you luck. You have a good plan there and uh, the city's lucky to have you. Uh, I also wanna thank uh, Katie and Megan and Teresa for putting on the webinar today. League of California Cities has been great as a resource during these difficult times. And on behalf of uh, your members, we certainly appreciate all you continue to do for us to support cities. Uh, and as I get into my presentation, uh, I do wanna thank some people on our team. Uh, Nadia Fieser, our Administrative Services Director, has been uh, valuable as our uh, financial leader uh, as we chart these ter territories uh, that are unknown. And for many of you who may be on the call that are finance professionals, thank you uh, for your uh, courage and your forethought in trying to navigate these and advise us city managers on how we move forward. I also want to thank Gordon Jackson, our executive director of our Conference of Visitors Bureau, and John Sorgenfry of TJA Advertising, uh, who is our um, ad uh, and public affairs uh, agent and, and really uh, helps position us as we try and navigate when we'll be coming out of this. So let me uh, start a bit about the city of Pismo Beach. Uh, I've been the city manager for, I've completed seven years, I'm in my eighth year. And so I really enjoyed the community and grown very close to it and have a real good uh, feel for the community and for our residents and those who come. And it's a real privilege to serve as a city manager in a resort town like Pismo Beach. As you can see in our slide, we are a full service city. So we provide all services, which uh, actually there's some benefits to that uh, during a time like this. And uh, you can really focus on service. You can really pinpoint uh, what you need to be focused on and you can be nimble. Uh, which has been really helpful. And you can see so uh, that it's the size of our organization. If you haven't been to Pismo Beach, I'm gonna show you a few pictures here in just a second, but we are smack dab between Los Angeles and San Francisco. And uh, we are also the beach for the Central Valley of California, Bakersfield, Fresno, Hanford, Visalia, the whole area. 
Uh, you can see for a small city, our population is uh, right around 8,000 people, but we uh, grow in the summers to 40,000 people. Uh, you can see our, our general fund uh, budget is healthy for a city that size. Uh, and you can see that 65% of our revenue comes from tourism. So like many of you, uh, this is a, a horrible situation uh, that hit. Uh, and unfortunately for Chris, it was his peak season. Our peak season's coming. Uh, and so for you, many of you, that may be the case as well. Uh, let's go to the next slide and I'll, I'll share with you some images of Pismo Beach because this is part of how you get through this. You need to be reminding people of when we're through this, where they want to go and how strong our communities still are and how beautiful they still are. And you wanna stay in the forefront of your visitors' minds as we go through this to keep them dreaming, keep them positive and keep them longing for the time that they'll be able to return, which we know will be coming. And so that's an aerial shot of Pismo Beach. Our next slide will show uh, some of our bluffs and um, rock formations and uh, just beautiful ocean. Uh, we have some great festivals in Pismo Beach. Our next slide, it shows our clam festival where you can taste some of the world's best clam chowder. Being a clam chowder judge is one of my privileges. Uh, as city manager, and I, I like looking at these pictures because it reminds me that these times will come again. And, and finally, one of our beautiful sunsets, as you can see our city seal uh, is a sunset. And so the next slide will show you one of our beautiful sunsets. And so these are the things we sell in Pismo Beach and uh, we will be able to sell again. Uh, but one day this happened, next slide. Oh my goodness gracious, the COVID-19 virus came to town. And let me tell you, um, the picture to my, uh, the right on the slide there is me uh, watching a recycling center and watching how much stuff people throw away in their blue bin that they shouldn't. I was just amazed. And so that shock look is also what occurred uh, the day we went to shelter at home and our hotel occupancies went to roughly a zero. And so that was a, a real challenge. Uh, but on the next slide, then we have to say, oh no, now what? And, and, and how do we figure this out? So uh, what I wanna do in the next series of slides is give you a financial picture of the city and then talk about what you could do, hopefully what you are doing and what we're doing in Pismo Beach to navigate through this as a resort community so focused on visitor or so dependent on visitor dollars. So uh, let's go to the next slide and then the, the following slide, please. Uh, you'll see that this is our general fund uh, projection. I wanna share with you that in column B, you can kind of see uh, column A is where we ended up last year. So you can see what our revenue is at 23 million. Uh, this year we were looking at uh, revenues operating of 24.9 million uh, and those quickly dropped by $4 million uh, as we went into the uh, fourth quarter. And, and you can see that that's a devastating drop and that's largely uh, TOT taxes. And so uh, you can see that was a big hit to us. On the whole, I wanna share with you that we had a 17% loss in operating revenues. That's a one quarter. So if you multiply that by four, that's pretty significant. And that just goes to show you, and many of you are probably seeing that as well. Uh, and so you, I'll talk to you about how we dealt with that. But thank goodness we were able to uh, not, uh, we used a set aside that we were gonna pay PERS as part of the paying, continue to pay down our liability. I certainly don't recommend that right now. So if any of you are still considering that, I would not make voluntary payments to things like that. Uh, this is a time to use those dollars to protect yourself and your cash flow. And so we did not make a, an additional payment. This is not our PERS payment. This is the voluntary payment to pay down liability. So we use that and some of our other uh, uh, unassigned fund balance dollars, and we still end up not touching our budget stabilization funds or our general reserve, which was a key goal of ours to get through this fiscal year and get to our season to see what we'll actually be able to do in 21. So as a first lesson or thought I would share is, and you'll see what our uh, cost reduction strategies are, but one, be very conservative. Uh, we, we were assuming uh, very significant revenue drops in April and May. We're actually not seeing as significant but it's very important to be very conservative out front and uh, model your dollars. And if you do have a tourism season, like many of us do, I think you really, I'm holding off on making 21 decisions until I see what happens in July and August in our summer. And so I think I would share that if you're making year out, two year out predictions, those are really silly because you just don't know. And so I think you need to have micro projections uh, in 90 day increments to actually understand the impact of your season and we'll talk about that in our next several slides. Let's go to our next slide. I think immediately what we started to try and do was to create a culture of frugality. And I think we immediately, and how I talked with the staff, where we're well you know, used to being a city that uh, has revenues and resources, we've never lived like that. We, we've always been uh, very judicious with our dollars and very good uh, with how we spend. And so emphasizing that 
uh, as soon as this thing hit and we saw the bottom drop out on revenues, it was really important about being frugal and, and really uh, acknowledging people who are being good with uh, dollars and coming up with creative ideas for uh, how to reduce expenses and that sort of thing. And so immediately jumping into your culture and reminding everyone that every dollar counts and we're all in this together and recognizing people who have really stepped up uh, with uh, entrepreneurial ideas or great cost cutting ideas are important. But overall, as you're frugal, one of the things you wanna make sure you're positioning yourself for is that you're ready. This will return, the economy will turn on. We hit a red button. This was unlike any other recession or situation we've had before, we just stopped. There's a lot of money on the sidelines. There's a lot of anxiety. There's a lot of demand. And so when that green button gets hit and people can slowly start moving again, you're, you don't want your organization to be decimated. You want it to be positioned well to serve the people, serve your visitors, uh, and get your community in tip shop, top shape and take advantage of this, what I believe will be a huge influx of, of visitors with pent up demand. And so you want to make sure you don't cut yourself so bad that you cannot respond to that and then your community ends up not being able to provide the services it needs. Uh, we can go to the next slide. So as we look at what we're doing, we really wanted to look for value and results. And so as we know, this crisis has uh, been a game changer and we've had to do a lot of things different, remote working, uh, electronic processes, really changing how we do business. We wanted to also look for value. And as we start to make reductions and as we start doing things uh, to uh, right size the budget, how do we do them in a way uh, that really will help us take advantage of the upturn in the economy? So really being strategic. And I think that's, again, I can't highlight that enough, that as you're looking at cuts and expenditure changes and reductions, this is not a typical recession. A lot of these revenues may come back in the first and second quarter, probably second quarter of next year. And so you, you really want to make sure you're taking advantage of this time to catch that upturn. I keep saying that because it's so important. Our next slide, please. Let me show you, um, so as you look at this, how do you have a balanced budget this fiscal year and into the future? And I, I think that some of us won't, and that's why you have reserves and additional set-asides. I, I would suggest that if you have an 80% drop in revenue, you're not gonna cut your expenses 80%, you can't do that. And so again, how do you make correct decisions to, to kind of right-size the organization correctly but not uh, cut in such a way that decimates it. So when this thing potentially returns in three months, four months, uh, you're, you're just, there's nothing left of your organization. That's not appropriate. So we looked at really, there's a lot of low hanging fruit right now. You know, when, when conference travel is shut down, your buildings are shut down, you're, you're not buying uh, supplies or utilities or less. Those are really easy things to pick up. Just like Chris talked about his, his golf club. You know, there's a lot of expenses he's not making. And so combing through your budget and really looking at all those things that you're not paying for and you're not doing uh, really uh, are something we want to do really quickly. And that yielded a lot of dollars. Uh, and then making sure that you have the correct cash flow and, and, and then creating different scenarios. So as I talked about, you want to make sure, uh, you know, a two and three or forecast to me just doesn't make sense. And, and we may argue about that. But having a pessimistic, realistic and optimistic scenario uh, of what happens if uh, how our tourism season goes this summer and then we can jump into that in August and then actually choose that scenario for the next several months, I think is really important. And so that's a large part of what we've been taking a look at. Uh, and then again, as you make cuts and reductions, you have to really consider the long-term implication because this is a very different scenario. And so as I'm looking at whether we implement hiring freezes or changes to service, uh, I'm looking at how that impacts the organization nine months, two years from now, uh, and, and is that where we want to be? As I believe tourism will be stronger than ever. And so we've really been looking at that. And then projects, you know, some projects you definitely should freeze. There are some capital projects. So like um, some of the paving and the work in our central core areas that are very hard to work in when we're so crowded uh, that we've been able to take advantage of. And so I think you really want to take a look at where are their costs, where are their projects that getting them done now are so much cheaper because of, um, uh, people wanting to work. And also, frankly, you don't have the traffic controls and a lot of the other things that you might need to do that significantly add to the cost. And so we really took a look at that as well. And so that's a question I'd submit to you. Are you doing that? A little bit about our revenue projections in the next slide, please. Uh, you can see that, uh, you know, in our city, uh, we, we did have a significant reduction of revenues, 5.2 million across all funds. To put that in perspective, you know, that, that's um, uh, about 15% in, in a quarter. And so that's really significant. And so 
what do we have to do? Well, you need to work with a lot of different people in your community. We spent a lot of time talking to general managers, uh, restaurateurs about what they were projecting, what they were looking at, what they were seeing, uh, doing a lot of research and uh, looking at data from uh, consultants and travel companies and that sort of thing to really try and come up with a revenue projection that made sense. But again, was conservative. I think it's okay and necessary to be overly conservative uh, right now. And so we took a look at that. Next slide. And then we started looking at where, where could we uh, reduce in a, our non-priority expenditures. And so I, I talked to you about that. We uh, cleaned up a lot. You'd be surprised some of you at some of the projects you've completed that may still be on the books. There's a lot of dollars there that you can uh, scoop back up of, of, of cleaning up projects that closed out and where you had savings. Um, I think it is important to uh, look at salary savings and potential freezes and temporary workers that you may not need because you don't have the people in your community right now. Uh, those numbers add up. As I said, there are some projects you should do. There are definitely projects you shouldn't. You know, we're delaying projects. We were going to update all of our park signage this year and things like that. Those are things that just don't make any sense. And so we, we were going to do some uh, amenities and, and kind of uh, beautifications and betterments to some of our community halls. Those just don't make sense right now. Those can certainly wait a year or two. And so looking at that, we talked about some of the operational savings that are really easy. Uh, you know, for example, we uh, stopped our, our contract planning assistance. We stopped our contract building inspectors. We stopped our, because if we can't do it in house, we're just going to have to wait for a while. And those are really easy things to do. And so many of you should have done that. Uh, and then you can just see some other things that we've listed here that are really easy things to do. Next slide. Uh, I think that there, while you're looking at cutting, you also need to look at what you're not cutting, you know, what you're investing in and doubling down. And so we've really uh, made sure our public safety budgets have what they need because we certainly don't want to have a situation pop up during these times when we're counting on them. And we've really doubled down on technology, right? So as we um, have more people working from home, my goal is to keep the workforce working. And I'm really proud of our staff and our team. Over 90% of our services are functional. You can pretty much do what you could do three months ago, uh, short of uh, a recreation class or, or, or some of the senior dances. You know, we're not doing those things, but pretty much everything else is fully functional. And so doubling down on technology and really making sure people are productive uh, has been a really good thing during this time. Uh, next slide. You want to continue to keep an eye on everything. And so we are really monitoring uh, on a nearly a daily basis uh, revenues and expenses and having a really tight control on things. That is really important uh, during this time. And our finance department has really had a tight control. Uh, and I'm talking with all of the division managers and department uh, directors on a regular basis. We have a great group. Again, we have this culture of frugality. Uh, and so this hasn't been that hard. But if you don't, you definitely need to make sure that you're watching every dollar out because they're just not coming in. And so it's very, very important that you look at some of these things. Next slide, let me talk a bit about communications. And so, as Chris said, you cannot communicate enough during these times, and it actually will feel awkward. It should feel awkward to you how much you're communicating, how much you're on the phone, how much you're meeting with people on Zoom and, 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 and conversation, because you, you have to. And so for your employees right now, you know, there's a lot of fear, there's a lot of misinformation, there's a lot of uh, thoughts people have, and so you really need to increase your communication uh, during this time. And so we really tried to uh, do videos to our employees, chats with our employees, really trying to keep them connected. Uh, we're starting to bring some back now, uh, but we've really tried to do that in through Microsoft Teams and emails and texts and just over communicating with your team. You cannot do that enough to make sure they're well, make sure that they know their employer's thinking about them. Because you know, there's several different types of employees, right? There are some who are working. In, in their normal environment, your public works folks, your police, your fire, then there are those who are working from home and they're working from home just fine, but there's still gonna be a disconnection because there's not that human element that they were seeing every day when they came into city hall or they saw their coworkers. And so uh, as the leader of your department or a city manager or as a council member, I mean, those communications are so important to remind people that it's gonna be okay and that things are still happening. Uh, that's really important. And so, and then in the, through these communications, it enables you to strengthen your financial position because you're reminding people where you are. Uh, there should be no secrets. You should be openly talking with your city family about your financial position and the choices you're having to make. And because you're all in this together and you're going to count on those very people to climb out of this uh, when, we, when we start to do that. External communications, absolutely critical. And so uh, I just want to share that we've had weekly business calls uh, every Thursday. 
Uh, we'll, we'll, we have several businesses that chime in and I talk about uh, efforts at the county, state, federal level, uh, what's occurring, what we're doing at the city to prepare, uh, and, and those have been helpful. Uh, I, I talk to general managers and hotel owners, lodging property owners, and some of our larger businesses, uh, in some cases every other day, uh, just checking in with them, uh, and, and then really helping them through the interpretation of recovery plans, how to operate safely, and so those have all been very important things. Next slide. And then the following slide after that, please. Uh, this is our reserve put picture. You can take a quick look. Uh, these numbers, I know they're, they're, they're not relative, uh, but roughly uh, you see we have, you know, about 35% uh, here. And a note about reserves, I think something else you need to be doing uh, with the council is really talking through what's an appropriate use of reserves. You know, you, we have these reserves. If you're going to use reserves, this is the time. Uh, but you also need to figure out you're not going to use all your reserves. What's an appropriate level to use for the situation? That's something you really need to have a conversation about. Uh, because remember, most of us are also in communities that have other threats, whether it's for us a tsunami or an earthquake or uh, a fire. We have, uh, you know, a wildland interface in our community. And so those are still prevalent out there, those disaster potentials. And you need to make sure you have reserves and ability to still deal with that as well. And so uh, those are very important things to focus on. Our next two slides, I won't spend a lot of time on, but I just want to kind of show you the financial modeling you should be doing. This goes to show you some of the stuff that we're looking at. Uh, and having different optimistic, pessimistic uh, options and realistic, and then taking a look at those and trying to understand what that means as you develop models that you can share with the elected officials. And so you should be doing this as well and really trying to stay flexible and understand what these look like. Our next uh, slide shows where we end up if we, depending on choices we make, where our unassigned fund balance and, and what type of balances we're using and where the general reserve is and where lines cross. And this is very important. I'm sure many of you have already done this. And so you need to keep looking at these types of things and, and really fine tune your model um, as, as you move forward. And then uh, last, you know, you need, you need to have some uh, benchmarks and action plans and you should have done that by now. And I think uh, if this, then what? And if this, then what? And so developing those sorts of statements uh, will help you feel that you are much more in control of the situation as we work through this. And so uh, those are some things I would share. Let me talk a little bit about recovery now, and then I'll wrap up. Uh, and you can see here, this is a, a surfer near our pier. And what I want to talk about, if we can go back one, please, um, while we're taking a look at this picture, uh, I want to share that the dirty truth is people are coming, people are traveling. And this has kind of caught us off guard a little bit. And so uh, people aren't sheltering at home and doing only essential travel. Our community, it's been kind of frightening, has been packed. Last weekend for Mother's Day, we had thousands of people in the community. The beach almost looked like 4th of July. And so um, how are you messaging? You know, we're messaging on Facebook. In other words, please don't come to our community right now. We're trying to stay safe. I think that's important for you. A political leadership needs to message so residents see that you're telling people, don't come to our community. Uh, we want to stay safe. And then what are you doing to keep people safe? And so I did appoint a lodging task force uh, that actually developed a series of measures for how hotels, if people were gonna come, uh, how are they gonna stay safe? Taking temperatures, having a code of conduct, uh, requiring face mask use. We actually, we bought with visitor assessment funds, uh, thousands of bandanas and hand sanitizers to give out to guests. So when they check in uh, with the code of conduct, they can see that we want you to wear this in our community to help keep us safe. That goes a long way with your residents. Uh, and then we, we've implemented uh, a program where businesses can uh, file for a free encroachment permit to take queue lines on the sidewalks. And so we actually are forcing businesses to have queue lines to keep physical distance. We put up hundreds of signs all throughout the community about being smart and staying apart. And, and so just really trying to show your residents that the, the people are coming, they're, they're here. And so how do we protect our residents? And that's been a real focus. And, and for you to maintain political trust and confidence, uh, you need to do the same in your messaging and what you're doing. So as Chris said, next slide, the key is that when we are able to travel again, it's all about driving. And, and, and people are gonna get in their cars and drive a short distance uh, to be where they're safe. And that's where we feel blessed in Pismo Beach. We're in a catbird seat, been three hours from LA, San Francisco, and two hours from the Valley. Uh, we're certainly a place people are going to want to go. And so as you can see here, uh, TJA Advertising has been working with us on our recovery plan. And, and you can see here's some of the thinking that we're doing, uh, planning on the drive is on for Pismo Beach. Let me show you a few trends 
uh, as we begin to wrap up and we can have some questions and discussion. Uh, here you can see uh, travel trends. People will be avoiding cruises, crowded destinations, areas hardest hit by the coronavirus. So, you know, most of us in California and our tourism communities are the opposite of these things. Next slide. And I'll go through these pretty quickly. Here you'll see uh, replacements, right? Are people going to change the type of travel they've been doing? Uh, large, large uh, agreement that they're going to be changing what they used to do. Next slide. Uh, here on travel trends, road trips are in. Uh, who will take more road trips to avoid airline travel? You can see millennials, 50% uh, will be taking more road trips and avoiding airlines. It's very significant. Next slide. Here you'll see where do they want to go? And this is why I'm bullish about Pismo Beach. Uh, I don't see deserts on the list here. Oh, desert. Yeah, it's down towards the bottom there, Chris. Sorry, but beach destinations is at the top. And so I couldn't help it. Chris and I go way back, and Indian Wells is a beautiful community. Uh, but beach destinations are on top, followed by small towns, villages, and rural destinations. And so uh, we're hopeful, and these trends that people are going to want to come. You need to be ready for them. That's why you can't make decimating cuts to your public works and everything else, because you need to make sure your town is safe. You know, we've been inundated by people on the takeout orders. Our trash has gone through the roof. I've had to deploy every trash can, have full public works crews on trash. And those are the kind of things you just have to figure out. Next slide. Here's the other thing I was sharing with you <coughs> is that people are delaying travel. And so where people would have traveled in May and June, we're seeing them on any travel in September, October, November. And what does that mean for school and families? Not quite sure. But the demand is still there. It's just pent up and shifting. And I think that's something we need to focus on uh, as we prepare. So let me show you a few of our ad campaigns. Obviously we aren't doing this yet, but you should have these in the can and be ready to go. So when it's okay to promote travel, here we go. We're ready. Uh, the, road, the drive is on for Pismo Beach and you can see far from the crowds, not far from home. No planes, no crowds, no worries. And so these are the kind of things that we're, we have millennials. Millennials will drive the return to travel. And so we're, we're featuring them uh, in our ads as you can see. And so that's what it's saying and that's what's important. Next slide, you still can't ignore uh, people uh, right now. And so we've been uh, having a very aggressive social media campaign about you know, experiencing Pismo Beach now and what's happening in our city and, and what it looks like and uh, you know, keeping in touch with people. Next slide, here you can see some of our other strategic messages of you know, getting off the grid. And here's these things, finding solitude, avoiding crowds, uh, that sort of thing. And really uh, sharpening that pencil so when it's okay, we can do it. Here's a sample next slide of our social messaging that we'll be ready to do. Um, you know, while some precautions need to be taken, we would like to welcome you back to Pismo Beach with open arms. Our town is ready for you to experience Pismo Beach. And so, no, we're not posting that today, but we have these ready to go. So when that uh, seems apparent that it's safe to advertise, we'll do it. Uh, and I'll finish out with a few more images and then we'll answer questions. You can see our next slide again. Uh, here we go. Uh, and some of these we've actually been posting uh, these kind of messages just to remind people that we're still there and that, you know, breathe in the fresh ocean is so complete. Just remind you that Pismo is still here and when it's safe to travel, we'll be ready for you. And my last slide is just showing the clouds parting and hopefully the sun returning uh, to Pismo Beach, uh, where we hope to welcome you when it's safe to travel. So thank you. I hope this was helpful. And Chris and I are certainly available for questions. Okay, thank you so much. These were great tips from two beautiful communities. Before we take questions, I'd just like to remind you how to verbally ask a question. Our speakers do want to take verbal questions. So if you are connected audio um, through your audio portion, please put your cursor, um, thank you, Katie, put your cursor um, and click on the, uh, which one link is it? Click on the participant list and, I'll, and you'll get another box and you can raise your hand. Once your hand is raised, that little blue hand, we will open up your, um, open up your line. So thank you so much. We do have some written questions also. You can put them in the chat box and send them directly to me. Um, before we get those questions going, we do have a survey that we'd like to put up and see what you're thinking about. Here's our survey. What percentage of your city's budget is derived from tourism? Give you some time to look at it. All those who vote, please, who want to vote, please vote. 
Oh, Katie, I think we can close it. It's really tight. So you said between 26 and 50% of your budget is derived from tourism. So that is a lot. Thank you for taking that. Okay, speakers, do you wanna, should we start with questions? Sure. Our first question is, are your cities deferring or waiving any TOT payments or late fees? That's a great question. Let me take a jump at that. So we felt uh, because lodging is such an important part of our community and we've uh, partnered with them on a lot of things because lodging is key, obviously, to our revenue and lodging has stepped up uh, most recently on an increase of our LBIT assessment by 1% uh, for capital projects related to tourism to extend room nights. And so we've really tried to do that. So we were uh, one of the very first cities to defer. We did defer March and April TOT payable uh, at the end of August. So we did give a 60 day deferral uh, payable at the end of August as a, um, but remember it's, it's difficult because TOT is collected mm -hmm. on your behalf. And so the hotels legally can't use it for other things. And so um, if you do this, you have to be careful. Uh, we didn't tell hotels that they could use it for other things because that's unlawful. And so we basically just deferred the payment. And so how they chose to deal with that with their cash was up to them. We did not have penalties or interest. Now, uh, May TOT will be due on time, and, and we do not ex plan to uh, extend that because our hotels are operating. And again, um, uh, kind of concerning to our community because uh, a lot of people are coming into it. And so they do have cash and they'll need to pay their TOT. Another interesting thing is some, some of our larger hoteliers, I was proud of them. When they got their PPP loans, they did the responsible thing and paid their TOT. And, and, and didn't wait till August. And so they recognize the city's providing valuable services and they paid their TOT. So we're seeing a lot of that come in uh, anyways, even though we did the deferral. And I'd just like to share that in Indian Wells, being that the season's really over here, we're not expecting much TOT from our hotel operators over the course of, of the several months. So we've actually deferred all TOT payments through the end of summer. And like Jim said is, you know, it, it provides them either cash flow benefit perhaps, but again, it's, you know, for them to decide, but it is something they're collecting from, you know, the guests and to go to the city. So we're not, we're expecting those TOT dollars to come back. Great. We're going to take a verbal question from Jenny McAdams. Jenny, I'm unmuting your line right now. Jenny? Hi, great. Thank you so much. And thank you for the presentation. Um, with regards to your plans, have you collaborated with or engaged your healthcare facility and medical community, um, especially with regards to, you know, when visitors are welcomed back and um, hospitality workers get exposed? You know, I, I think our, having our medical community as part of our conversations is important, especially with regards to their capacity. So I, I'm just curious if you've done any of that work. I'll be more than happy to start that off, that discussion. Uh, we, are, we have been meeting with them regularly. Uh, we have Eisenhower um, Health Center as well as other regional hospitals that have been, you know, working with all the different cities to provide the best guidelines. Uh, we get updates daily actually through the county of Riverside on uh, folks who are ill with COVID, uh, unfortunately the, um, the tally of the deaths, but the more importantly is the status of our hospitals as far as the ICUs, ventilators, all of that crucial information that uh, our residents want to know. And actually Eisenhower Health Center actually puts out a newsletter to residents that we share with our community as well that's been very well received. That's uh, great work, Chris. And yes, so we have been very cognizant not to offer medical advice or medical criteria or try and do things that the public health officer does as a city. But that said, we, um, I go to the county EOC at least once a week and participate in discussions with the EOC management team and the county public health officer. She's done a great job. Uh, we were very involved, we being city managers and other city leaders in crafting our reopening strategy. And in that it talks about the number of beds available, the number of vents available, uh, can we handle a 30% surge? We have an alternate care site in our community that can handle 900 additional cases. There's zero people in it right now. And so we've looked at and set up criteria so that before we 
reopen officially, um, that we have this ability and the health officer monitors that daily and we will take her lead uh, and, and take direct guidance from her. And I would encourage cities to be very connected to your county health officers. They have these plans and you need to honor them. And so in everything we've done, uh, we've taken her guidance uh, for public health. Great. Um, I'm not sure if he has a question, but um, Michael Coleman, did you have a question? You might have just been helping me out. Let's go to Ed Springs. Spriggs? Sorry, Ed. Ed? Ed? Unmute. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Ed. Hi, Hi. Ed. Great. Well, I, I have um, two related questions. Uh, one is, uh, for both city managers, thank you very much for these really informative presentations. Um, I, I really appreciate it very much. Uh, I'm in Imperial Beach. Um, I, I'm on the, um, uh, we have an emergency task force here and I'm on the, and chair of the committee that deals with city planning, uh, uh, sustainability and recovery. So this is right up my alley and very much appreciated. Um, first question is, when it comes to TOT, are you, do you have any survey information? And Jim cited some, uh, I think you both did, that indicate whether um, vacation rentals are going to be more popular in the near to medium term than hotels as destinations as, you, as, you, as we go into recovery? And what should we be promoting? Should we open up more vacation rental uh, areas in our city, that sort of thing, in order to more rapidly recover in terms of TOT. And the second question, and this is specifically to Jim, you were not really in favor of, of uh, projections beyond 90 days, but we have to think, it seems to me, about whether there's, we need to think about FY21 and the scenarios regarding whether there's gonna be a resurgence or not as we open up, as, um, predicted by the uh, health experts. Uh, and if there is, what effect is that going to have on travel? So, and I think high, medium, and low projections there may be of, of some value for thinking about FY21, which is coming right up. So those are the two questions. Chris, do you want to start on the residential uh, stays at all? Do you have anything to comment on? Or? Oh, I briefly, and you know, we may be one of those unique, unique communities here in Indy Wells. We actually um, have a ban on short-term rentals. We allow short-term rentals only during the Coachella Stagecoach Festival and the tennis tournament um, as far as citywide. Now, we as you may know, Indy Wells has several um, homeowners associations or gated communities. They are allowed to opt out of the program and provide short-term rentals if they wish to do so. So we haven't focused much of our effort looking into that data, um, but that could be an area that we probably should look into um, in the future. So I would, uh, Ed, I would say that uh, one, I think the trends show that people are going to travel when they feel safe, right? People need to know that they're safe and secure where they're traveling. And so as right. we as communities communicate that we're safe and we're secure, that I think will allow people to look at the destination. Now, how do they choose to stay? I haven't seen specific uh, data on vacation rental versus hotel, but in conversations, um, I think it cuts both ways. If you're at a vacation rental, you're isolated. You're gonna feel safe in this house. You're distant from everybody else. There's no one in the room next to you. You're not walking down crowded halls with people. Uh, and so I think there's some merit to that. However, uh, I have talked to a few uh, vacation rental companies they're struggling to put together the enhanced sanitizing uh, ability and the enhanced cleaning ability that some of the larger hotels are able to put together and, and broadcast. So I think it's going to be an issue of some may feel safe on their own in a home, uh, but question how clean the home is, uh, where others in a hotel have more people but know that there's significant uh, cleaning efforts and they'll be seeing staff continually to wipe things down you know, throughout the so I think that's an interesting question. Now, as for are we going to do more uh, short-term rentals or vacation rentals as a result of this to balance the budget, I think the council, that's a political uh, policy call for yourself as a council member. Um, I think that in our community, 
the council is uh, very reticent uh, right now. They're making sure the citizens are safe. And I think we've all been kind of caught off on how many people have been coming to our community. So um, I think encouraging more people to turn their home into a vacation rental probably wouldn't happen because we're concerned about the number of visitors coming now and in the future. I think also, as you and I have talked about, our community has a pretty strong vacation rental uh, ordinance for residential vacation rentals uh, outside of the downtown area. And it's only your primary home that you can use. And I think for a while, people aren't gonna want strangers in their primary place of residence. So I think uh, that is certainly gonna impact uh, the vacation rental in our community and that's something to be considered. As far as budget projections go, in communities like ours, the bulk of our revenue comes in July, August, and September. And so what I'm saying is, to make a prediction for what happens in June of 21 really depends on where I am at the end of August 20. I mean, I, I need to see what type of summer do we have, and I plan on going to the city council at the second meeting in August with our projections for 21. And, and, and I've already projected models that have a terrible scenario if no one came in July or August, or there was a, a huge uh, outbreak again and, and, and people don't travel uh, versus a 50% July and August versus a closer to normal July and August. And then based on those, I have revenue trends then that align to uh, organizational operational planning. And so that's what I think people should be doing. I have seen some cities making decisions now uh, based on what they think will occur in the summer. Well, if you're cutting half your staff and furloughing people and creating all these situations and you have a near normal summer, you just aggravated your workforce. And you don't actually even have the people on hand if you lay them off because they need to work. Believe me, I need every single public works person on the field right now. Our beach was trashed, unfortunately, over the weekend. It looked like 4th of July. And so I'd have every public works person out there for cleaning our beach. Um, our trash cans have been totally overrun. And so you, you have to have the staff. And so that's what I'm saying is I think we need to see what kind of summer we have. I certainly wouldn't wait past August, September to be making financial projections for fiscal year 21 by any means. It's just early to say now. That was what I was trying to share. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ed. Uh, speaking of staff, you mentioned that the, you have to have a lot of communication with staff and reassure them that their jobs are safe. But how can you guarantee this with the, all the uncertainty around the budgeting process? And have you considered uh, staff furloughs? Well, I'll respond first as I'm the one who brought it up about making sure your staff knows they're safe. And that's also communication that you have to have with your city council. And so early on, the city council said, yes, our focus needs to be to protect our employees. As we have gone through the, the, um, the virus and our budget, you know, we are not looking at any kind of significant impacts of staff through the, the end of next fiscal year, assuming there's no relapse uh, and hoping and, and assuming that we're also going to have the tenants tournament next year. If that was not to happen, that'd be another huge financial impact on our community. Um, employees have already agreed and volunteered, I should say, to defer salary increases they were um, hoping to get this year to the end of this year, early next year. Um, I think that's huge. They deserve the kudos um, for, you know, what the future may hold. Until we have a better grasp of when there might be a sense of normalcy, it's really difficult to make the guarantee long term for all those employees. I think that's a great answer. And I think in our culture, we have something called cuz we're Pismo. It's a very service driven, employee centered culture. And I'm very grateful for our city council uh, for allowing to have such a close family knit service oriented culture. And so, um, you know, having layoffs or, or, or rapid cuts is, would just be uh, against our culture. Um, what we've done, you know, since I've been manager the last seven years, we've actually shrunk the staff. And a large part of that was counting on technology and doing things differently. And so, uh, the council understands that we're, we're very lean and, and a large part of our staffing costs relative to our general fund dollars are much smaller than other cities and we invest a lot of that money in projects and so in, in, in beautifying the community and so as a result our staffing costs are, are, are lesser relative to others and so I think we'll be in a position better to weather this. Uh, some of our uh, not our general fund reserve but our budget stabilization reserve was uh, created by the council with the thought that we would use that to buffer revenue losses. And so between that and a, a combination of, I, I do, we will do a freeze on certain positions. I think that's just responsible. If you have, and roughly 9% of our uh, staff positions are vacant right now, and that's, it'd be crazy to fill those right now. And so uh, hold, holding those open, uh, doing your operating expense cuts, pushing back capital projects and, and using some of our budget stabilization reserve, not the general fund reserve, 
uh, to offset some revenues will be our recipe, I think, for working through fiscal 21. Uh, and then we'll see where we are. And so we've told our employees they're okay. And I really appreciate our council uh, foresight and say it's hard to save money. Uh, it's funner to spend it. But our councils really showed a lot of restraint and, and good for them. And they've supported our employee culture. And our employees are going to work harder And uh, as a result of that as we, we climb through this. So uh, we're not there yet. I understand some communities are just having a really hard time and may not have prepared for this. And those are you know situations you're going to have to face. But Chris and I have councils who have uh, really put money aside and uh, we're gonna use that first before we have conversations about those other things. We are approaching the hour mark. Do you have time for a few more questions? Sure. Okay, here's some TOT advice from David or asking for TOT advice. We are considering a ballot measure for a 2% TOT increase in November before COVID and now are, are unsure of how to proceed with the voters' attitudes. Anyone, anyone else considering what to do or any advice for this November ballot? Uh, yeah, we actually are doing the same thing. So I'll, I'll talk to you about it. So we were looking at a TOT increase in November as well, long before this of 1%. Uh, and we were gonna use that for some general fund uh, for some projects that were important uh, to the lodging community uh, that were visitors serving. Uh, and we actually weren't going to, we were looking at maybe delaying the implementation of the TOT increase until after our 1% LBID. Uh, and we, we increased our LBID from Lodging Business Improvement District from 1% to 2% a year and a half ago for five years. And that, that money is financing our Pier Plaza project, the opening of the Pismo Preserve, some of those kind of things. And so when that fizzled out, we were going to then put in the TOT 1%. We did some polling, and, uh, which you obviously should do. And 76% uh, roughly of our community supports the TOT and nearly 50% strongly agrees to support it. So we have a strong uh, position of support. That poll was taken uh, the week after the shelter at home went into effect where people were fearful. And so I, I think we feel pretty confident that we will be considering putting this on the ballot on June 5th uh, for the November election. I think you should too. I think when we see our residents that are concerned about the impact of visitors. I think that plays into more support for a TOT measure because the residents don't pay this tax and they see that they uh, want to, if there's more fiscal support that can come in, uh, they want that. And so also further because uh, we were thinking of postponing it until we work through the LBID, uh, I'm advising the council not to do that at all, that, that we need, we will need some of this money if it gets approved, which in polling it looked very strong, uh, we implement it immediately. Uh, and I say that because we may need some of that revenue to fill back up some of our reserves and, and our residents want a financially strong city in the polling, uh, nearly 80% of them felt it was important to have financial security and reserves. And so um, I think that the residents will wanna see it go into effect immediately. And I think as far as lodging, there's gonna be so much pent up demand for a destination like ours. I don't think people are gonna care whether the TOT rate's 13 or 14%. Uh, they're gonna just wanna travel. And so I think it's a good time uh, to move. So I would strongly advise you to move forward in November with your TOT uh, ballot initiative. Uh, we will be doing the same in Pismo Beach. I fully agree with Jim's strategy. I think he's spot on. Uh, you know, going back to the whole idea and the messaging of, you know, timing is everything. You know, Indian Wells actually had a TOT measure on the November 2018 ballot. And it was effective in January 2019. So as of last year, uh, we already had an increase in our TOT. So we're not looking to increase at this time. But, you know, Jim alluded to it, and that is who really looks at what the TOT rate is when they go to book a hotel or one of their stays at a resort. And so, you know, I don't think that that's going to be the deciding factor whether or not people travel or to a certain region. So I think if you have the opportunity to sneak a TOT on the ballot, um, and again, the residents are the ones paying for it, and they want to have those visitors who, you know, impact your community, pay for the services that they get a benefit from, go for it. Okay, we're going to take one more question. How are you um, currently dealing with enforcing the current restrictions of COVID? Like the six feet apart, social distancing. Yeah, that, that's a hard one. Uh, and, and I think we have to be honest with ourselves about, and this is, you know, just hopefully league family members on this call. We have to be honest with ourselves about what we can enforce and not. And I think uh, we're starting to have those conversations in our community. You know, I mean, People still, and I think the, if the more you enforce, the more you can agitate and cause anxiety. And I think, again, my comments may uh, 
be, find disagreement with some of you, but as reality, you know, as, as we look to people aren't sheltering at home, they're getting tired of this and, and I, they're traveling. Um, now I don't have the constitutional right to stop and search and seize and ask everyone, are you here essentially, what's your business, where are you coming from? Nor do hotels have the ability to legally deny people uh, renting a room. And so uh, for a number of reasons. And so when you have that situation, I think the best you can do uh, is encourage people to uh, politely uh, try and follow the rules. So what we've been doing, our beach has been very crowded. And so we have very big social distance, physical distance signs as you enter the beach. We have an officer every 30 to 45 minutes driving by. And you know, for the most part, we'll say, hey, can you guys, you're a little close to this party over here. Would you mind just moving a little bit? And 99% and of the time people do it. Um, when someone doesn't, uh, we, we up the ante a little bit. We haven't had to cite anybody for it, thank goodness. Um, there are families that look larger than people living together. We'll ask the question, are you living, are you guys all in the same house? And they say, yes, what are you to do? Ask them to turn around and pull out their ID. We're not doing that. I, I think it's just, it's, that's a challenge. Um, we do politely ask people to stay in the queue lines. Uh, right now we're looking at a mask ordinance, which I know is controversial in some communities. Uh, and, and I think that the ultimate version of that mask ordinance that will approve doesn't really rely on enforcement more than it does social pressure and uh, having signs in your windows saying wear a mask, that sort of thing. I think we just have to be honest with ourselves about what we can and can't enforce. And I think the more presence you can see and the politer you can be to encourage people to do things. We also have a governor that keeps saying we got to count on each other to enforce these things and count on social pressure and social norm. And so I think as you look at policies and you look at things, I think we just have to be very honest with ourselves about what we can and can't do. And so in Pismo Beach, we're trying to take the friendlier approach, uh, create social pressure, uh, create the signage and the messaging, uh, and, and rely on our business community. My calls, I talk about that all the time, that we're hopeful people will, will help. Uh, and, and, but it's a tough one, and I think it's a reality we just have to face. So it seems things in, you know, Pismo Beach and that region are much more positive than they are here in Riverside County. And what I mean by that is, uh, on Friday, the county supervisor rescinded all public health orders here in our region. So masks are recommended and not required anymore. Um, social distancing is not required. But we have been cleared in New Wells to send out the message to our residents and businesses and guests that please respect those who re request you to wear a mask and to social distance when you visit their establishment. You can expect that when you come and visit City Hall. Um, what makes it even more challenging is we are a contract city, as many of the other cities out here in the Coachella Valley are, and our sheriff has publicly said he will not be enforcing um, any um, social distancing measures um, as a, a, you know, an order to his officers. So it is going to be quite interesting how things are handled here in the Coachella Valley. Uh, there's also a task force for recovery and that the county has put together. It includes Chamber of Commerce's, other, you know, uh, countywide organizations, but yet there's not one city elected official or city manager on this task force. So, you know, the whole concept of, you know, solutions need to be local. We're very concerned that that's not going to happen because the local officials who are the experts in their certain areas are not being heard. Well, Chris raises a good point. The other thing, and I know it's frustrating for some of our elected officials, and I certainly can appreciate their frustration. Um, these things are being driven county by county. And our district attorney, who's an elected official, has said he's not prosecuting uh, physical distance violations or mass violations or anything else. And so when you already know that you can put your peace officers in a challenging situation that can get aggressive quickly if they take on some of these things, knowing that the courts are closed and that the DA will not be prosecuting these types of violations, um, what tool do you have then? And, that, and that's a, a question. And so again, I think um, using, uh, persuasive influence, personal power, uh, and, and, and messaging, I think, are some things we really have to rely on. Thank you so much. Before I ask one final thought and a takeaway from each of you, I just want to remind our members that we are going to continue on with this COVID-19 webinar series for several weeks now. Um, we are going to have a, our next webinar is Thursday, May 14th, and it's called What Now? Reopening City Operations. We have two other great speakers that will um, be telling you what their cities are doing and how they are reopening and what they're thinking about um, reopening mindfully to keep their residents and employees safe. We'll have Reva Feldman, City Manager of Malibu, and we'll have Steve Schwalzbagger, 
from City Manager of Lodi. So please join us on May 14th for that. Before we end, I wanna thank our great speakers, Chris and Jim. Thank you so much for not only taking the time, but also giving all those great tips to our members. Is there one last thing you wanna say before we wrap up? I'll be more than happy to, and that is to remind everybody, whether you're an elected, uh, a city manager or a staff member, you're not alone. We're all in this together. Um, you know, Jim and I will poke fun at each other. We've been friends for many years. You know, if I needed something, I can call on him. Uh, please feel free to do that with, you know, Jim or I. Uh, the League of California Cities is a great tool that people need to use more if they really need the assistance. Uh, but again, look at your friends, your colleagues for the help through the, these difficult times. Uh, every decision you make is not gonna necessarily be the right one. You're gonna learn from it, but keep moving and keep chugging along because things will get better, will be a sense of normalcy. And again, communication, 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 and make sure you take care of your employees. Great messaging, Chris, and I, I agree. Stay optimistic, we, we have to. Um, have confidence in yourself and your decision-making. Keep your elected officials involved and informed. And so they continue to build political capital and trust in the community. It is so critical. I know in emergency times, it's easy for the staff to just start running and uh, the director of emergency services and you start making all these decisions, you cannot leave out the elected officials. It's their community, we're their staff. And so I think it's very important that you continue to help the elected officials uh, have trust. And, and through that, of course, is the communication uh, and believe in yourself, you know, no one has a playbook for COVID-19. No one has a playbook for how to uh, manage a tourism community that just had the floor pulled out from under it on revenue. Um, but we'll figure it out and we'll figure it out together, as Chris said, and, and we're going to work on this. And I can't imagine uh, anybody else uh, better than us to deal with this right now. And we're going to serve our cities. We're going to serve our councils and we're going to do the darn best we can. And I have confidence in all of you to be able to do that. So stay well. Thank you both. For the latest updates on what the league is doing about the coronavirus, please visit our website, www.cacities.org backslash coronavirus. Thank you so much. And again, thank you to our speakers and our members for taking the time. Have a great day and please stay safe.